This morning I want to bring a, me a message that is entitled, you may wonder what this means, but Jesus everywhere, then he wasn't, and then he was. Jesus everywhere. I want you to know right now that Jesus is everywhere. You just don't always recognize him. You just don't always see him. He's there. On the road to Emmaus, you know, they saw Jesus, they talked with Jesus, they didn't recognize Jesus. Mary Magdalene, after he was raised from the dead, she is, where have you laid him? Where have you put him? And she thought he was a gardener. Uh, he's there in many ways, many places. He's always been there. He's not hiding from us. I always like to point out that sometimes, not God, but God takes things that we need. And he hides them, not from us, but he hides them for us. You say, well, well, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, well, you don't need everything right now just piled up in a big pile. You need it when you get there. And so he's already packed your stuff. He's already got it on the road. He's got it on the way. He's not hiding it from you, but he's hiding it for you. So that when you get there, you go, oh my goodness, God has provided a way. God has provided a lamb. God has provided the sacrifice. God has done all of this. And a part of Christmas is a part of recognizing and understanding what God has done for us. We take probably one of the most famous verses of all in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, for unto us a child is born. Well, I want you to know that unto all of us a child was born, but then it says unto us a son is given. Unto us. He's a child to everybody, but he's not a son to everybody. Because sonship requires being a part of the family. And so for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. This was written over 700 years before Jesus was born. And because man dissed an appointment, God has come. You know what a, a disappointment is? It's a missed appointment. Who missed an appointment? Well, Adam and Eve were walking with God every day and God visited with them every day. He saw them face to face every day. And then one day God came down in the midst of the garden and guess what? Adam and Eve couldn't be found. The Bible says that Eve took the fruit and she ate it and she gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. How many of you know we try to cover up our own sin? They sewed fig leaves. They, they tried. And they, they heard a voice. And it was the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Amongst the trees of the garden they hid. And the Lord God called unto Adam and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself let's pray father I ask you to help us today to recognize Lord that we are hiders that sometimes we like to hide but Lord you are a seeker and you are seeking the lost you're seeking us so that we might be found, so that we might be saved. You're seeking us so that you might give us your peace. You're seeking us, Lord, so that you can provide healing. You're seeking us, Lord, so that you can take the weight off of our shoulders. You're seeking us, Lord. We are hiding and you are seeking. Help us today to recognize that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, God was looking for you. He was looking for you so strong, so strongly. I love it 
John says this in John chapter 1. I'm gonna, I want to hone in on one voice, but I, I've just got to give a little context. It says, in the beginning, John says, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14. That's verse 1. I read verse 1 through verse 4. Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the word became one of us. Why? So that we could know him. Jesus everywhere. God walked with him. During the day, he visited with them. And I see that more today than I've ever seen it in my life. Pastor Clyde, I'm sure you're in the same boat that I'm in, that you can see Jesus in more ways and more places than you ever saw him before. You know, this year I completed my 40th year in the ministry. I've been in ministry for 40 years now. And, and, and you know, I, I passed that day on June the 1st. That's when I passed that date, but... But you know, there are some things that I'm ready for now that I wasn't ready for. I'm doing a, a PhD program on semiotics and theology. I wasn't ready for that 31 years ago. Why? Because I didn't see what I see now. You know, when I went to college, when I went to Bible school, man, I wanted to get in them word classes, man. That's what I want. I don't want no history class. Goodness sakes, the minor prophets, are you kidding me? I don't even, I don't even like the Old Testament at that time in my life. I'll just be real honest with you. When I was a little kid, I only read the red letters in the Bible. Why? Because I knew those were the words of Jesus. I was like, why well, don't I want to read anybody else? <laughs> How many of you see that God loves us even in our immaturity? I told you last Sunday I had a great case of versitis. I could quote the verses, but I couldn't always tell you the story. Because I'd been trained to quote the verses. Ah. Uh, now, now I could go somewhere and step on some feet there, but, but you know, I had to learn the story. I had to learn the culture. I had to learn the history. I had to learn the times. I had to learn the place. I had to learn the people, you know. But when Jesus came into this world, he didn't come into this world with history. He didn't come in to, to change little things. He didn't come in to change the government, although the government wasn't perfect. He didn't end all wars. There were slaves around him. I want you to see what it is that he came and why he came. The only thing we can say about God when he came is he didn't come to fix the government. He didn't. The Bible says the government will rest upon his shoulders. He came. When did he come? The Bible says in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. In other words, it wasn't political. He didn't come to fix this or to fix that. But in the fullness of time. Jesus is everywhere. I didn't see him everywhere. There's absolutely nothing that he cannot do. I'm going to see him today. I'm going to go to the hospital today. My daughter's being induced today. We're fixing to have a baby girl. Amen? And I'm going to see Jesus at the hospital. But let me tell you something about Jesus. I'm not taking Jesus to the hospital with me. He's already there. He's going to be there before I arrive. He's going to be there before I get there. But what he's waiting on is he's waiting on an acknowledgement by me. I mean, he's not looking for me to find him. He's looking for me to acknowledge him. And I want you to realize this. I cannot escape God. He is everywhere. I can't escape him. Psalms 139 talks about this just a little bit. David, the writer, he says, I can't escape God's knowledge of me. The writer said, I can't escape. God's presence the writer said I can't escape God's power and his sovereignty I can't get away let me just quickly quick, quickly read some of this he said oh Lord you have searched me and know me now notice he said oh Lord you have who's doing the searching he said you have searched me 
and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search, here he is searching again, my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. I love this verse. Well, I could preach on this. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me amen I, I think that's a word for the Novisky family you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me such knowledge the writer says is too wonderful for me it's too high I cannot attain it you see, Satan's lie, the devil's lie, is that God is hiding. God's not hiding. The devil would love for people to believe God's hiding from you. He just won't show himself to you for whatever reason. I had a, a dear friend that I ministered to for years and years and years, literally. In West Columbia, I knew him from a teenager, and he let us use his it was a Chevy dealership. It was the, the parts and the, the house where they worked on the cars. And he let our church use that free for, I mean, literally decades. It was our bus barn. We kept 23 buses there. I, I had a bus route that I went out on every single week. Tremendous stories there. But, but what I want to get back to is this man. He was such a good man and he gave. You know the story I gave last Sunday on the rich man Lazarus and the beggar, you know. Uh, Lazarus was, you know, had the, the leprosy and he stayed at a rich man's gate and he was fed rich man's food. You know, sometimes people don't see the fullness of that because they don't look very deep. But right there in the midst is God. Right there in the midst. And this man, I don't know what it is, but he said, oh no, Pastor Rusty, I can't go to church. He said, I'm a bad person. And, you know, and I did the, you know, we're all bad thing. You know, we've all sinned. He said, if only you knew what I did. If only you knew. I don't know what he did. All I know is that God was around him everywhere. I have another friend, good friend. Of course, I have a lot of friends that are murderers. That's not any, I mean, y'all know that. But I went to church with them and, said oh she is so bad she is oh don't make her mad oh you just wouldn't believe she was the sweetest lady uh, she later Ann and I was watching television and the cops are chasing this car down the freeway they pull them over and it's my friends <laughs> getting out of the car and he was a master instructor and trainer uh, in, the, in the army and the marines on judo and all kinds of I'm like dude if you only knew who that man is you're grabbing a hold of you'd treat him with a little more respect and they laid them all out and she she had murdered her child years ago but she found Jesus and she served time and she's free we're Facebook friends I haven't seen her in a while Ray Morgan is her name but I can say one thing about Ray that I can't say about my friend at the bus barn she's seen Jesus How many of you know that sometimes the most obvious thing is sometimes the hardest thing to see? You know that old saying about, you know, we can't see the trees because of the forest? You know? I don't know what happened to my friend when he died. I tried to show him Jesus. He's everywhere. The writer goes on. And he says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, and there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be the night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is the light with you. 
He said, I can't escape your presence. I can't get away. You see, Jesus is everywhere. And he says things like this, that my sheep, he said, they know my voice. I want you to know he's speaking, he's talking. Are you listening? But for a moment in time, for a moment in time, he was and then he was not everywhere for a moment in time because why because he loved us so much well what do you mean pastor I'm, t I'm talking about the Christmas story I'm talking about when God the creator the maker of the heavens and the earth and the Bible says the whole earth is full of his glory that all of a sudden this man that was bigger than anything bigger than everything better, bigger than all he shrunk himself down and he became a baby. A baby just like me. A baby just like you. A baby just like my little granddaughter. A baby. Not knowing who he was. Not knowing who she is. You know, she doesn't know who she is. But she's going to have a birth story. And I'm helping in that birth story. I've been taking pictures for that birth story. Because two weeks ago I realized this. I never thought of this before. But every child deserves a birth story. Your birth story is about you. How many of you realize Jesus has a birth story? We read it in the Bible. Not just he was born one day. He has a birth story. I want you to know stories are meant to be told. Amen. Stories are meant to be told. The, the Paul says that you are a living epistle. An epistle is a book of the Bible being read daily by all men. You have to let your life and let your story talk. And Jesus came into this world with a story that was being told 700 years before he got here. And what he did is he took up the pen as an able writer, a ready writer. And he continued to write and to tell his story. Now, here's something maybe shocking in the Bible times. The Bible was never, ever, ever meant to be read silently. The first known time that the Bible was ever read silently was in the fourth century. One of the church fathers says, my goodness, what are you doing? Because someone was reading it silently. You see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. If you have a secret story, your secret story is not going to touch many lives. I'm going to tell you the very thing that sometimes the devil wants you to be ashamed of is really one of the best points of your life because God turns it around and he uses it. I'm looking at some old alcoholics when I say that, sitting on the second row because they have a story to tell of alcoholism a story that could just be as horrible as you can imagine but also a story that can be as amazing as you've ever heard because they don't hide their story how many of you know that at some point your story is worth being told because that's not who you are it's who you were you understand the difference between that don't get stuck. You know, when Jesus became the Word, why did he become the Word? Well, let me say it to you like this. The author is the person with the authority. The author. I was talking with Dr. Lynn Sweet a couple weeks ago doing my, my doctoral program. And he says, you know, I've come to places where on one book he was writing, the, the editor wanted to change something about the book. He said, you change it and I'm taking my book away because it's no longer my book. He said, either I tell it or you don't tell it. Because the author is the authority. Jesus, what did Jesus do? He became what? He became word. He came to be word he was everywhere and then he wasn't he came in a person he came to us a child is born he left heaven why because he loved us he left heaven to become one of us he was a child that was born just a baby but a baby without realizing his own identity a baby who didn't know his own story just like my little grandbaby is going to be born she doesn't know her story so I'm going to give her a story do you understand that's called raising a child? Do you realize that? That's how you raise a child. The world doesn't define them. You define them. 
I've raised a couple of kids really successfully, and it wasn't by letting the world define them. It wasn't by letting the world raise them. How many of you know God has a plan for every child? including me, including you, including yours. But we've got to tell the story. Hebrews 5 verse 8 says, Though he were a son, capital S, he was a son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. He became aware of his own story. He became aware of the Christmas story, the birth story. Like, I, I call my little granddaughter, I, I call her R. Cutie. That's Roxy Quinn Triol, and they didn't name her that, but that's all right. I'm calling her R. Cutie, because she's my cutie. And so I've got a story for her, but she's born mostly blank, but then we give her a story. We've been praying for her. We've been believing God for her. I know more of her story than she knows of her story. How many of you know that somebody knows your story from the beginning to the end? It might not be you, but Jesus became the author, the authority of our salvation. Jesus was fully man, 100% man, but he was also 100% God. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. What does that mean? That means that he grew and he learned just like any and every other child. The Bible says he, he, he grew strong, he waxed strong in spirit, something different about the spirit. He was wall-to-wall -wall Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to live and abide in him. So much so that Jesus made statements like this. Jesus said, if you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. Man, woo! Jesus said things like this. The gospel that I preach, it's not my own. He said, I didn't come to preach me. I didn't come to do me. I came here to do the Father who's in me. Are y'all getting this? You see, Jesus came to be a reflection of God the Father. But in that moment, in that time, you realize Jesus was not everywhere. Jesus was at an address. Jesus was at a place. Jesus was a person. When he was 12 years of age, this is so interesting, he's 12 years of age, and, and you know, Passover is something that... that it, it, the Jewish religion is unlike many other religions. You can't just send somebody for you. The whole family had to go. And, and I, maybe I'll share about Bethlehem because I'm, it's just um, so few people know what Bethlehem was. What happened at Bethlehem? Why was Bethlehem important? It was a, uh, not a very big place, but it was where the sacrificial sheep, the lambs, were raised. How many of you can see in the story now, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Where did he come from? He came from Bethlehem, where only the sacrificial lambs were raised. Are y'all getting the picture? Swaddling clothes. Most people have no idea. He was wrapped, and, and the scripture says this will be a sign to who? To the shepherds. To the shepherds. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll preach on that, what swaddling clothes actually were let me just tell you this swaddling clothes were blood soaked stained you couldn't get the blood stain out but instead of throwing them away they washed them and it's what Jesus was wrapped in as a baby the lamb of God this will be a sign to you shepherds not the world to the shepherds this will be a sign you will find a baby wrapped in blood-stained swaddling. What we're swaddling for, it was for the birth of lambs. The Lamb of God, born at Bethlehem. What is that? It's a sign. It's a sign. It was a sign given to shepherds. How many of you believe today, I, I'm just going to tell you, that God does things just for me? I see 
signs. I'm not preaching those signs because it's not the gospel. It's not the word of God. I'm just telling you this. I have a personal relationship with God. God does things for me. And I go, well, God does does you. There you go again. God does you. Wasn't me. That was you. I want you to know he is everywhere. When he was 12 years old, they they went into Passover and they lost him. They got a a day's journey out and they couldn't find Jesus and they went back because the whole family had to go recognize this as a huge caravan. They had to go to Jerusalem. I mean, this puts special emphasis on Bethlehem because it's where all the sacrificial lambs came from it put special emphasis on his entrance through the sheep gate when he came into the city and why they were laying things down in front of him all of these things were signs but there's signs all around us I want you to know Jesus is everywhere and he wants to show up right at your address he loved us so much he left heaven to have an address so that he can be known of man amen Amen. and when he's 12 he's teaching in the temple He's teaching the rabbis. He's teaching the teachers. He's 12 years old. They're amazed and they're astonished. And his mama comes and jerks his chain. Says, boy, what are you doing? Where, what? Mama, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? She said, well, yeah, well, you know, right now you're fixing to learn some obedience through the things you suffer. And he submitted He was a son of God, but he was trapped by time and space. He was trapped by time and space. That had never happened. He loved you so much. He came. He was born as a human. He left heaven. He left the power, the glory, the domain. He loved you. He went to hell even and paid the price for you, becoming our sin, becoming our death. He was everywhere. Then he wasn't because of you. He was born in Bethlehem. What a city. Wrapped in swaddling clothes. He would die for you. He did die for you. But you know what? When Jesus came and he was trapped in this time, he was trapped in medieval times. These are medieval times. You know, Luke, who writes one of the Gospels, was a physician. You know what Luke wanted to do? You know how Luke treated you? He put a leech on you or he cut you or he bled you out. Did Jesus ever say, oh my goodness, Luke, no, we don't bleed people. Let me tell you something. Make sure you get this. Jesus was more interested in being known than he was in being right. How many of you know people that will lose their relationship over being right? They will argue. Everything around Jesus was an argument. At that time, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, scientists, people of science in that day and that time, they believed that trees caused the wind. And here's Jesus, the creator and maker of the universe, listening to this junk. We call that junk science. How many of you realize today's sign is junk science? It's all junk. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. You know, we just discovered this system that so many years away that it was... Blah, 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 blah. We can't even tell how old a dead piece of dog meat is. I mean, and we're trying to judge millions of years. You don't know. But I'm not going to argue and lose my relationship with you. Why? Because it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Jesus came to be known. And Jesus is going to tell us about it. He didn't come to be right. He came to be truth. Did you hear me? He didn't come to be right. Because the government was messed up. You know, he was crucified in a messed up system. He didn't say, oh, this isn't fair. No, he humbled himself and he died. He came to be known. His birth story was told. He came from Bethlehem. He was a sacrificial sheep. There were signs that were given. There are over 300 prophecies that predict and say who Jesus is. That the chance of Jesus not being who he says he is, the mathematical chance is this. If you take the state of Texas, big state, and you stack it two feet deep in silver dollars, the entire state of Texas, and you put an X on one, and you throw it out somewhere in the state of Texas, 
and then you rent a helicopter and you get in the helicopter and you fly now here's the catcher though you don't just fly over and find a, a coin you blindfold yourself and you reach down and you grab one coin out of the state of Texas the chances of Jesus not being who he said not being what the Bible says not in the flesh you got a better chance of picking out that one coin he came to give us a story and to give us an address and he died your death I'm wondering do you know him do you know him do you know who he is he's not hiding He's not hiding. He left heaven to chase you. He left heaven to become one of you. He left heaven and died for you. Let me get ready as I close. Let me read this story to you. In John 16, verse 31. I'm reading from the, the 16th to the 17th chapter. How many of y'all realize the Bible was not written in chapters? It wasn't written in verses. Let me read this story. He says, Jesus says, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Why did Jesus come? Why does he have a birth story? That you may know him. What does he say about that, knowing him? This is eternal life. This is it. This is where it starts. He says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Do you get that? He said, Lord, I finished. This is right before his crucifixion. I finished, Lord. Now I pray that you would give me back the glory that I left when I came into this world. I was. And then I wasn't. And I want you to make me, and I want you to understand this, this word forevermore. You see, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. He was all of this, he became this, and he said, but now, I'm forevermore. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me. Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world. Some translations say created before the world existed. I've manifested your name to the people. How many of you know a name represents a person? He was given a name, and the Bible says that name was above every other name. I gave your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. Remember, he became the word. And they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. 
I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He said he would come back. But in that moment when he was here, he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. Just for time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole story in John chapter 20, verse 11 through 18. It talks about Mary Magdalene and how she saw him. She thought he was a gardener. Again, there's a sign. She didn't recognize the sign. She saw him, but she didn't know who he was. She didn't recognize him until he spoke her name when he said, Mary. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. She turned and said, Rabboni. It's the son of God. She went in and she didn't see him, but she saw two angels sitting there. She says, where have you taken him? Where have you laid my Lord, my master, my savior? Where have you put him? She thought he was a gardener. And when she knew who he was, she ran quickly over to him to grab him. And this is when Jesus said these words, touch me not. In the Greek, the word there means cling to me. Don't cling to me. He said, because I have to go. But I'm not leaving you by yourself. You see, at that point, Jesus was still in flesh. Jesus was Jesus. Where was Jesus? He was right there. She's grabbing a hold of him. He said, let go of me so that I can again be everywhere are y'all getting this this is the Christmas story and Holy Spirit God the Father Jesus the Son and Holy Spirit Holy Spirit came I love this I could go on and on forever you know when Jesus walked through the walls you know they're they're all hiding and they're all afraid they're afraid because Jesus just got crucified. They don't know what's going to happen to them. Peter denied even knowing him. He was worried they're going to crucify him. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks in and he does something. And if you don't understand the sign, you don't recognize what it is he's doing. When he came through the wall, it'd be kind of shocking when somebody does that. He came through and he lifted his right hand. Now, you have to read the scripture to understand that every word is there for a reason. Why did he lift his right hand? Well, I'm just going to tell you the whole story. The left hand is the dirty hand. It's for taking care of things. And the right hand is the hand for greeting, and it's also the hand for war. When you greeted somebody and they were your friend, you showed them that you didn't come with a weapon. Remember, I read to you, the zeal of the Lord will do this. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, why did he ride on a little donkey? Because kings rode on war horses when they came in to make war. He came in to make peace. He said, I'm not carrying a weapon. Because you know who was, what was the weapon? Jesus was the weapon. He said, I'm not carrying it in my hand. He said, I am that I am. I am the word. I am, remember, who has the authority? I am the author of your salvation. I carry all authority. All authority, Jesus said, on heaven and in earth has been given to me. Can you not get excited 
about Christmas? Can you not get excited about Jesus? Can you not get excited about the one who has all authority, who left all authority to come into this world and to be born like me and born like you? He loved you so much that he said, I want you to know me. Know me, know me, know me. He said, I'm going to know you. I'm going to become just like you so that you might become just like me. How do we become like God? You become a son of God. Amen. God doesn't have any grandkids. He's only got sons and daughters. That's all he has. And Christmas is when he left his throne to be like us so that we can leave our low thrones to be like him.